morning again. Let's now take time to read God's word. <clears throat> Let's look now at Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Colossians chapter 3. Today we will be reading verse 12. This is the word of God. Let's all rise, actually, uh, as we read God's word together. Put on, then, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. This is God's word, and may God bless you with his word. Do you know that you are loved? It's good to know what, that you're loved. And maybe sometimes we don't always think about it or feel it, but I hope that we can say that we are loved, and that we are loved by many people. It might be good for us to think about saying it more frequently and saying it to each other. Parents, when was the last time you told your children that you love them? Or children, when was the last time you told your parents that you love them? Siblings, do you ever tell each other that you love each other? Husbands and wives, do you tell each other that you love each other? And do you believe it? Do you mean it? Maybe we're not always as good at saying it because we're not always as good as we should about showing it. But I think it's important to be reminded again that we are people who are loved. And today's passage reminds us about this. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, we are told that we are loved. We are the beloved. And when Paul is writing this, and he's saying that you are holy and beloved. It's not that Paul is saying here, and the point is that Paul loves the Colossians, or Timothy, Paul and Timothy here are uh, saying that they love the Colossians, and that is why they are beloved. That may be true, but the reason why Paul is saying here that they are beloved is because they are loved by God. And they should be sure of this. They should know that this is who they are. This is part of their identity. And this is something that you should be sure of that you should be confident that you are loved by God. Now, when we look at this passage, there are three things that are brought together that we see here in terms of uh, this love. It is to be loved, to be chosen, and to be holy. And for many people, those three things actually uh, get us confused, I feel. Sometimes we feel that because we are not growing in holiness in our personal walk with the Lord, or because we are sinning too frequently, and we see in ourselves things that we are not proud of, the lack of that holiness causes us to doubt whether God is a God of love or whether God is a God who loves us. Perhaps it's because of those things that we doubt whether or not we are chosen, whether we are elect by God. But if you have read your Bible well enough, you would know that these three ideas are very interconnected. They are very close with one another. And typically, 
When we look at these three, these three things, they are supposed to help us and further us on from one to the other, to know the other. You see, it's because of God's love that he elects. It's because of his love that he chooses. And because God chooses, and he chooses for himself his own special people, that is why they are holy. You see, when God sets something apart, it is made holy. Like the seventh day, it was set apart and was made holy. And this is what we see in the Old Testament. And it was true for them, and it is true for us today. If you were to ask the people in the Old Testament, do you know if God loves you? If we were somehow able to interview them or to talk with them and ask them that simple question, do you know if God loves you? It would have been obvious. It would have been plain and easy for Israel to say this. Any Israelite would have easily said, yes, I know that God loves us. And the basis of that love is made clear because God has chosen. He has elected Israel. That's why they would know for a fact that God loves them. The reason why they can know this is because God tells them this over and over again in the Bible. Uh, there are many passages that we could read, but I will only read to you two. In Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 15, it reads, Yet the Lord set his heart in love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them, you above all peoples as you are this day. You see, God sets his heart on you and he chose you. And that is why you could be certain of the love of God. How would they know that they were loved? By the fact that they were Israel. They were God's chosen people. That's how they knew. It was God's act of choosing that made it clear to them that they were loved. And you see, when God chose them, it was not because Israel was great in itself. It wasn't because Israel had many advancements in technology or in their culture. It wasn't because Israel was a remarkable nation. In fact, it was the exact opposite. It was because Israel was so small and insignificant. It was to show that Israel was so unworthy and undignified that they were not supposed to be the recipients of this special love of God. It revealed the characteristic of God's love as being gracious, undeserving, and it was true. Because you see, they were unworthy of this love, and yet God proved it to them because no matter how faithless they were, God would continue to remain faithful. The second passage I'll read is Deuteronomy 14, verse 2. And we see here now the connection between God's loving and his choosing and holiness. It reads, you are a people holy to the Lord your God. 
out of all the peoples on the face of the earth, the Lord has chosen you to be his treasured possession. You see, when Deuteronomy 14.2 describes the people as holy, we see this as characterizing them as something that is set apart for God. Now, normally, when we think of ourselves as holy, we often think about it in terms of our righteousness. We think of it as, are we doing what is right and what is good? Are we being made holy and pure, devoted to the Lord? But when you read Deuteronomy 14.2, we see that the reason why the people are set apart as holy, it's so that they would be a treasured possession. It was meant to let them know that God loved them. You see, God loves That's why he chose. That's why the people are meant to be holy. And this is not just something that is only for the people of the Old Testament. Okay, so it's easy to know that you're chosen if you were in the Old Testament, right? It's easy to know if you were elect in the Old Testament, right? Why? Simply because you were a descendant of Abraham. You had, been descent, you had descended from the special line of Abraham. It wasn't so clear for the people in the New Testament to know if they were elect because it wasn't limited to being part of the line of Abraham. But it's still the same. God's love is the reason why he chooses, why he elects his people. And it's because God elects his people, it's because God has chosen you, that's why we should be holy. We see this in many places, but I'll read to you only a few from the New Testament in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 4, Paul writes, For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. And we see again the connection of being loved by God and being chosen by God. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 But we ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord, because God chose you as the first fruits to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Now we see here that the person who is chosen by the Lord, is the one who will be saved. And the one who will be saved is the one who believes in the truth, who through the Spirit believes in the truth and is sanctified by this Spirit, the Spirit of God. And so this is where we could see if you are called by the Lord, you will believe in his truth. And the truth will be made very clear when you believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not that you just understand the gospel. Can you explain the gospel to someone? Do you understand why a person can be forgiven of sin? Why they can receive eternal life? It's very important to know this. But there are people that I've met that they understand 
the message of Christianity, and they hate it. They don't believe it. But you see, this is where it is faith in the truth that is important. And this is where we should understand this was all part of God's plan for us, that he has chosen us and he uh, chose us because he loves us. And it's because of this that we should be holy. We should have lives that, as Paul writes here in 2 Thessalonians 2.13, that are sanctified, being made holy. And this is a process. This is a process that is ongoing. So we shouldn't get discouraged when we're not finished yet. Right? But what Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, is that we are beloved by the Lord, and he chose us to be saved. But it's through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth that we would be continuing in this process. In Ephesians chapter 1, this seems to be brought to a crystal clear clarity. In Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. You see, it was because of God's love. God's love seems to be the cause in the Old Testament and in the New Testament to be the reason why he chooses. But one of the things that we find here in Ephesians is that we are chosen in love, but we are chosen in Christ, in him. And we are chosen in him so that we should be made holy, that we should be holy and blameless before him. These three things are connected, and it is something that should be inseparable. And so when Paul here writes in Colossians chapter 3, put on them as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved. These three things in Paul's mind are clearly connected. It's because you are the chosen ones, you are holy and you are a people who are loved. And so you must know this. This is who you are. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you believe that he is the savior of sinners? Then it should be clear to you that you would know the love of God and you would know that God calls you to holiness. And so this is where Paul says, put on then. And this is contrasted to what we put off. If you remember, Paul writes, put off the old self with its practices. And when Paul writes this, there are five things that he wrote in two different lists. We see in verse 5, there were five things that Paul listed. 
And we see again in verse 8, there were five things that Paul lists to put off, to put to death, to put away. But now this is where Paul says, put on. And again, we notice there are five things. The five things that Paul lists here, it's a compassionate heart. And a compassionate heart here, uh, it's literally described as bowels of mercy. Bowels of mercy, it's, it's the feeling you get when you see someone and you feel mercy. You don't just think, oh, I should do something, and it's just a cerebral thing. It's not just something that you feel in like a warm, fluttery feeling, and you feel like, oh, I should do something. No, but in your gut, you feel that this is wrong. This is wrong. This is not right, and I need to do something about this where your gut tells you that you need to be moved. This is a, what Paul is describing here in compassionate hearts. It is love characterized by mercy. It is a tender-hearted mercy. It is a tender mercy. It is not cold or calloused. And we're told also to be kind. And the thing about kindness, especially when we read the Bible, this is where we see that God's goodness expressed towards us, especially in his acts of grace. When God acts in grace towards us, and God shows us his goodness, it is often described as his kindness. And this we could also see in Ephesians chapter 2. It was because God, in his rich love, in, I'm sorry, rich mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. When the Bible describes God's grace towards us, it is often described as kindness. This is what Paul is saying that we need to show to others, kindness. It is God's kindness that leads us to repentance, Romans chapter 2 verse 4. And so, one of the things that we should understand about our kindness as well, it should also be marked by graciousness. Our kindness should be marked with goodness. Sometimes kindness is marked with selfish pride, that we want to make ourselves something more than we are. And we're kind. That is not how God is kind. When God is kind, it leads to repentance. When God is kind, it flows from his grace. That is what Paul is calling us to do. That our kindness towards one another would be motivated because of grace. And so if you lack kindness... Perhaps it is because you lack grace. The next quality that we are meant to show towards one another is humility. And humility, when Paul writes here in this passage, it is a culture-transforming characteristic. Because 
At this time, humility was not a virtue. In the ancient world, humility was negatively viewed. It was seen as weakness. It was understood as, uh, in the terms of servility, as a servant. That servants or people of low power or class or ranking, those were the people who needed to be humble because those who were in power, those who had Greatness were meant to be great, not humble. But humility was a Christian virtue. It was something that was very clear that in the Bible, that it wasn't just you know, after Christ as a Christian virtue, but it was something that all of God's people were meant to show. You see, if you wanted to be a person who walks with God, you must be humble. Micah 6.8 tells us very clearly that you need humility. It is necessary for a person who walks with God that they must be humble. And it is also clear in Scripture that it is with the humble that God dwells. You walk with God, you must be humble. But it is God who also walks with you. Because God is the one who dwells with the person who is humble and contrite in spirit. Isaiah 57 verse 15. The passage I read earlier when Christ tells us to take his yoke, it's ultimately because he is humble in heart and gentle and meek. And this is the next characteristic that Paul lays out, meekness. Meekness is where you do not assert yourself in power over others. It is a gentle strength. It is where it is often described of animals like lambs. Lambs are meek and mild. But Jesus Christ tells us in the Beatitudes that actually it is the meek that shall inherit the earth. It is the meek who seem to be without power who will reign and they will inherit the earth. The last attitude and characteristic that we must put on is patience. You see, patience is an interesting thing. Because can you imagine, was God patient before there was creation? Did he need to be patient? Did the Father need to be patient with the Son or with the holy angels? we see actually that patience is the attitude that is displayed by God towards sinful creatures. Patience is something that God shows towards sinners. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 2, we see this, this harmony of these, a few of these characteristics Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. And so when we show patience, we have to recognize that it is often towards sinners. It is towards someone who has sinned that we need to show patience. It is recognizing that there was wrong, but we don't always lash out in judgment. We don't always lash out, but we are wanting for the person to be restored. Rather than bringing down, we want to lift up. That's the goal of patience. Patience is for healing. 
Now you see, when we read these five characteristics, these are things that are of the new self, of the new nature. These are the things that we must put on. And if we remember, we are called to put on Jesus Christ, the Lord, Romans 13, verse 14, or Galatians 3, 27. We must put on Christ. And these are the characteristics that we put on, not because we are better, but because we see these things in Christ himself, that God has shown these things to us first. Do you know that God has a compassionate heart towards you? That God saw us in our misery and in the state of sin. And he saw us and he knew that if he left us alone, we would die. And so he doesn't. He looks upon us and his heart is filled with compassion. And he tells us to live. He shows kindness towards us. This is the result of his grace. When God acts in grace because of his heart towards us, he is kind. And we see this when Christ humbles himself. He came to this earth. He humbled himself and took the form of a servant that the person that shows us the humility that we need to embody is Christ himself. There is no greater example of humility. There is no one in this earth that can show us better this humility. Ironically, the one who is the greatest, the one who is the most exalted, happens to be the most humble. It goes completely against what the Greeks at the time thought, that with power, you don't show humility. But for us, the humility of Christ was displayed in his meekness and his mildness, that he was not just someone who would come and take the form of the servant, but he would also become a lamb. That Christ, in his meekness and his gentleness, he would take the cross willingly, and he would not open his mouth, but with great gentleness, he would bear even a cross. I don't know about you, but if I had to ever do something like that, I probably would grumble so badly. I would probably be like, ah, oh, rolling my eyes. And, but not Christ. So meek, so gentle, even to those who were condemning him, even those who were cursing at him and mocking him he would still pray for their forgiveness. And his patience was able to endure the cross. That he was able to endure sinners to the degree that he who knew no sin would be made sin. He who was perfect in every way would be crucified. You see, you must understand that you are chosen by God. You are loved by God. That is what it means to be chosen. And we know that you are chosen because you believe. That's where Paul writes to the people in Thessalonians. He says, this is why we know you are chosen, because of their faith. Romans 1.1, 1, 1, to all in Rome who are loved by God and chosen, called to be his holy people. It was to all those who believed. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Do you know that he is compassionate towards you, that he has a tender 
mercy? Do you believe in Jesus Christ that he is kind, that he is humble, that he is meek, he is gentle, and that he is patient towards you? Do you believe in Jesus Christ and that he is all these things? Then, dearly beloved, you must put on Christ and put on his heart. You must be like him. You must be holy. Or in other words, you must be his treasured possession. This is why God chose you, that you would be a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord has chosen you to be his treasured possession. Let us pray.